Professor Kevin Ashley, we're both from Pitt Law, um, and we're going to be talking to you about peer review, computer supported peer review in law schools. Um, computer supported peer review has been used all over the place and enables classrooms that have no writing because of um, insufficient grading or feedback resources to add writing to the curriculum. And we think that it can effect more, better legal writing instruction and provide a way for dramatically increasing the amount and quality of feedback that law students can receive. More specifically, we're going to be talking about SWORD, which is a peer review system that has been developed at the University of Pittsburgh where we work, and that Kevin has used in teaching some of his law school classes. So, Recently, I attended a faculty plenary at Pitt where one of the discussions was about um, peer review. And had faculty from all of the university were there, and they asked this question, three questions. Do you wish you could give more writing assignments in your class? And quite predictably, many professors said, yes, I wish I could, 82%. Next question was, do you wish you could give students more feedback on their writing tasks? And this was even bigger. 95% said, yes, I wish I could give my students more feedback. And then the third question was, how much would you trust peer review? And you sort of had the choices of going from no way to, oh, yeah, bring it on. And again, you see about 80% of the people were hesitant. They're interested in it. They think it's pedagogically interesting and maybe useful, but they don't want to use it because they're uncertain of whether students are capable of providing reliable and valid review. These are typical of faculty responses, and what we hope to do with our presentation is to persuasively demonstrate that peer review can be safely used and relied upon. As teachers, we're faced with a, a challenge that has been with us for many years, the challenge of giving feedback to all of our students when there are so many of them and so few of us. And I think that we can all agree with this statement, professional and academic success in all disciplines depends at least in part upon writing skills. Um, this is certainly true in the law, and this is, can be the most challenging skill for faculty in law schools to help students with, especially in their larger classes. So we have uh, two goals uh, for trying to improve legal education. Uh, and the first is to address the uh, crit criticism that law school uh, needs more feedback more often. Uh, the best practices uh, uh, work, criticize law school for a lack of formative feedback during the semester, over-reliance on that inf infamous three-hour end of semester exam, that uh, often has very little feedback associated with it beyond the grade. And the other major criticism of law school is that we need more effective ways to teach legal problem solving and written argumentation skills to help first one else to learn uh, really what it is to think like a lawyer. And this involves uh, broader problem solving skills, including uh, grounding analysis and facts and comprehensive spotting of relevant issues, applying the appropriate standards, weighing the competing policy considerations, and so forth. So 
Our tool of choice is peer review, and of course peer review is not new in legal education. Uh, many of you may have uh, used peer review in the context of Turnitin. Uh, there have been some very nice law reviews uh, written about peer review, uh, but by and large uh, the focus has not been on computer-supported peer review, which is relatively new to law schools. What do we mean by computer-supported peer review? Well, stu students write their compositions according to the instructor's assignment, and then they submit them online to a system that distributes the compositions to a group of N student peer reviewers. Usually the N is four or five. And those peer reviewers use instructor-specified review criteria and forms to assign the author's work a rating as well as written commentary. And then they submit the feedback back to the system. The system sends the feedback to the authors. Uh, the uh, review is conducted anonymously, both with res respect to authors and reviewers. The authors uh, provide back reviews uh, to tell the reviewers whether or not the reviews were helpful. And then, uh, depending upon the instructor and the assignment, the authors uh, may use the information to revise their drafts. So that's our little introduction to computer-supported peer review. And in the remainder of the uh, talk, we're going to show how one uses the SORG program for this, uh, focus on those all-important legal instructor-provided peer review criteria, answer two important questions, can students provide adequate feedback even on substantive legal issues, and do students benefit from peer reviewing? Then show you a little bit about what we hope to be the future of peer reviewing and uh, speak about some communal instructional resources uh, that should become available. SWORD. So this is the fellow who um, first invented SWORD. His name's Chris Shun. He's a psychology professor at Pitt. He's considerably older now than he is in yes. that picture. <laughs> He's a little grayer. But, but he's a very engaging fellow and really smart. Um, so he came to Pitt as a psychology professor. Pitt has about 17,000 undergraduate students, and the most popular major is, in fact, psychology, which results in classes that look like this. The, uh, the 1L, the, 1L, the psychology one, intro to psychology classes. I looked in the fall um, course book for next year. They're all capped at 400. <laughs> and for that, you get a professor and a couple of teaching assistants. So um, Chris found this rather depressing, <laughs> trying, to, trying to provide any kind of meaningful feedback to his students that would help, help them learn how to write, help them learn how to think. And then as he was looking out at this massive audience, he thought, why does it have to be me who provides all the feedback? There's an infinite scaling opportunity here if we could just figure out a way to use them. For every extra student in the class, that's an extra student who could provide feedback to others in the class. And he asked, is there a good way to use peer review to add more writing into the classroom? And this turned out to be a really big and really useful question. Now you're probably thinking, we've tried peer review, it doesn't really work, it's kind of so-so, you get, you know, students don't bother, they don't take the time to really look at it. So, and Chris realized that it was possible if, if there's some way that you can get the students to do a good job, then maybe you could, in fact, turn peer review into a very powerful tool. So he came up with the sort process, and Kevin just described it, but... Just to reiterate, it's an anonymous process. Um, it's completely done um, online. The student um, writes a paper, it turns it in, and it's assigned to several reviewers. The, re the reviewers have to use the teacher's rubric that they've been given for reviewing the, um, the papers. Um, the writers, and then when they give the papers back, the writers of the paper rate the comments that they receive from their reviewers. And your grade for the, for the project includes a grade for your reviewing as well as for your writing. 
So just a brief show to show you what it looks like a little bit. You probably can't see this really well, but um, SWORD looks like any course management system. It should be familiar um, to your faculty who might want to use it. It's, it's not difficult at all. You have to go in, you register, you create a course, um, and then you have to go in and you start to create assignments. And there are also excellent um, videos on the site that will help guide you through the process. So you create your assignment, you give it a name, and then you have to set various things like how much of the grade is it worth, whether you want the same reviewer for each draft of the paper that gets turned in, and whether or not it's going to be what's called back evaluated, where you have the uh, reviewed person reviewing the reviewer, as it were. What's that called? Is it back evaluation. Back evaluation. It's one word. Um, for drafts, you have to decide how many drafts you want, if you want them to do one draft, two drafts before the final draft, or if you just want them to, to turn in one assignment. Um, and then this is the hard part. This is the part that really is going to take your time and effort, and you have to really think hard about it if you're the faculty member, because this is where you have to create your rubric that the students are going to use to evaluate the other students' papers. So you see a new rating screen. Um, again, it's, it's not unlike TWIN. You can just you click on to create a dimension of the rating that you want the, the students to be looking at. And the goal is to have at least 25 dimensions that they will be reviewing the paper on. Uh, rating. Rating, I'm sorry. Yeah. So maybe uh, Ratings and five, five criteria and multiple ratings per criteria. That's what it is. And then you have, you can number them from one to seven, you know, from really lousy to really good, or depending on what your criteria is, those may be completely different. Um, and this is the part where you have to create the reviewing rubric where you have the, um, the two factors are ratings and command prompts that make up the rubric. So when you see the new rating screen, you have to click on New Dimension, Create It. And then you can also see um, there's a library of ratings that other people have used in the past. So if there are a number of courses being given on the same topic, um, you can use other people's ratings um, to be, to, in your assignments so you don't have to do all of the work. So the, here's an example of someone else's rating from the library where one of the ratings is abstract and the scale of ratings is from insufficient to excellent and each step is described. Um, the next step is to set up your comment prompts. Now this is where the students have to actually write about a review about the paper that they're reviewing. So you name the comment prompt and then you say what you want the students to look for in the paper they review. And you can say whether you want them to do to write one comment about that particular aspect, if you want them to write two or three, um, however many you want. I think the maximum is five. And then here, for example, is a comment prompt from a physics lab assignment, where the um, which gives very specific information about what they want um, your comments to be. Once you have the comment prompts done, then your assignment is ready and. Um, you can upload them into the system, and you can preview it. That's what the preview looks like, so you can edit it whenever you want to. And then what the students see is essentially the reflection of what you've just input into the forms um, in SORT. So they see for a to-do list of all of the things that they have to do. If you've set various deadlines, they see what their deadlines are. It's all very clear. Um, they have a list of all the things that they need to do and when they need to do them by. And you can also set it so that there's a grace period. If they don't get the, their assignment done by the deadline, they may get a, you can give them a day, but take 20% off if they turn it in late, that kind of a thing. It's very flexible that way. So the student can um, go in. This is the student view of the back evaluation, where they have to say what they thought of the comments on their paper. And they can say, any, you know, they can say it was a great comment. It was really helpful. It's they're rating on helpfulness basically, 
whether it's helpful or how the comment could have been better. And then after the uh, back evaluation is completed, they submit it and they get taken to their timeline, which again shows them what they still have to do. The student still has one more back evaluation to do. So it's a lot of work for the students. They have to do, write a paper, then they have to read four papers or so, and do back about, and uh, review them, and then they have to read their own, the reviews of their own paper. It's, it's a lot more iterative than your normal um, writing process, really. So what Chris found was that there were two simple strategies that you can use to get reliably good performance out of your students to get when they're doing peer reviews. The first is give them a really good rubric to use. Now we're all familiar with rubrics, even if we don't have written rubrics necessarily when we're grading. I know we all have them in our heads, what, you know, what we expect people to say in their answer to the hypothetical, um, what they left out, what kind of, if they want, if you want them to mention a certain statute, a certain case. And so you have to be able to put, write that down so that the students who are doing the reviewing can understand it and see what you're looking for. And that's a little bit more about rubrics. And you may have to do a little bit of work to translate your rubrics into um, something that's understandable by students, but um, you should be able to do that. The rubric's just the first step because second, the second strategy is that you have to ensure that they're accountable for their reviews and that they're going to do a good job. So what Chris found was that um, if you just um, make something valuable at stake, like your grade, then students tend to do a better job. So um, there's a grading incentive. And then for the uh, rating part, where they're just giving numbers from one to seven, there's an algorithm that checks to make sure that the student isn't just sort of randomly going through and picking numbers. They, ha they have to have the same kind of, um, generally the same kind of uh, reviews that other students who are also reviewing the same paper are giving. So then, they have, then they're going to be accountable for both the quantitative parts of their review and for the qualitative review, their comments. So Chris's basic formula when he was making SWORD was that clear rubrics plus accountability for ratings plus accountability for the comments um, is the SWORD system, which is what we are talking about. And this is just a little graph of the algorithm that's used for the ratings. I don't know if Kevin used. I, I didn't uh, use it. I did make uh, good faith uh, participation in the peer review uh, part of the grade, however. Yeah, well, law students are more honest than undergrads, right? But <laughs> or maybe. But it does sort of check to make sure that you're not just way off, way off base with what you're doing, and the professor can pull your uh, review to see um, if, if there's some reason why you're ratings are so different from everybody else's. So basically it says you're going to get a good grade for your rating test if the way you rate the documents that you've received is correlated with everybody else's on average. Accountability for comments comes in the back evaluation. So these are two examples of um, the comments. The, these comments force you to be a constructive comment giver. So you could get a very, give somebody a very low rating. The one on the left is a very low rating. Uh, no, that's the high rating. The one on the right is the low rating because the comment was some word choices and sentences aren't formal enough and the grammar should be checked, which you know people who comment on grammar and spelling often have problems with it themselves. <laughs> and <laughs> and the, he was given a one for that comment because it says, what do you mean by format, formal? What areas on the paper do I need to check grammar on? You need to include that so I can benefit from your review. So at the same time as you are um, getting some comments on your paper, you can also tell people how they could be more helpful the next time that they review. And Kevin's going to show, show you some examples of really high um, comment ratings that are quite impressive from law students. OK. Are you up? Uh, yeah. 
So uh, one of the key features of uh, the approach is in the construction of these uh, review criteria. That really is where the instructor is providing uh, instruction. And uh, there are at least two ways to uh, apply the SOAR program to a law school uh, context. Probably the most obvious one is, is as part of teaching legal writing using SWORD as peer feedback on a student's leading legal writing uh, coursework, uh, perhaps in a 1L course. But the way that I found most interesting is as a way to provide feedback on exams. Uh, I've been using uh, SWORD so that students can provide each other feedback on midterm exams. You remember midterm exams from your undergraduate days. I dare say you didn't have them in law school because they're too much work for the uh, professor to provide uh, grading and feedback on since there were so many students in law school. Well, I've always felt that that was one of the worst features of law school, that it didn't have at least a midterm exam with feedback. And I thought that uh, SWORD might be a way uh, to provide that. Uh, but as I say, for either use, a key ingredient is in the construction of uh, the criteria or a rubric that's uh, tailored. You don't have to look at the details here, but as uh, Susanna pointed out in SWORD, there are two kinds of uh, criteria frameworks. One is for ratings, and the other is for comments. And here is uh, a little close-up view of a rating that uh, one might use for argument assessment in a legal classroom uh, uh, writing assignment. Does the paper assess strengths and weaknesses of a party's legal positions in detail? Does it recommend and justify an overall conclusion? And then we use a seven uh, position Likert scale. So you have to figure out, well, what's the best? The best they could do is it assesses the strengths and weaknesses of a party's legal positions in detail and recommends and justifies an overall conclusion. And what's the worst? Well, the worst is it doesn't assess strengths and weaknesses of parties' legal positions and fails to propose or justify an overall conclusion. And then the hard part is coming up with the gradations in between. Uh, but generally, we just come up with the gradation for rating three and five and then uh, leave uh, two and four uh, to the imagination. And it has uh, worked out OK. Or another example of a review criteria, this is a more uh, content-specific one um, concerning personal jurisdiction. How well does the author analyze the issues of whether EP, that's the name of some party in a problem situation, can get personal jurisdiction in aims over AA, another party. And here, the best is to analyze all important issues, all arguments, pro and con, and supporting facts, cites relevant legal standards, statutes, or precedents. The worst is doesn't identify the issue at all, and then uh, great gradations in between. As to uh, comment prompts, here are examples of two that I've used. I teach intellectual property, so uh, mine tend to be focused on IP claims, one for idea misappropriation, which is a sort of state IP claim. Comment on how well the author analyzes whether expert, that's another party, in problem situation would have a claim for idea misappropriation against Z Inc. What, if anything, did the author miss? What could the author improve? Or registration under trademark uh, under section 1052, comment on how well the author analyzes the issue of whether the Einstein icons and slogans are registrable under section 1052. What, if anything, did the author miss? What could the author improve? It's not easy uh, to come up with those uh, detailed criteria. Fortunately, as you do it from exam to exam, you have a library, a personal library of criteria from the last time, and you can often adapt them. And if there were a community of people using these in uh, law courses, uh, there could be a more public library if they're willing to let their rating schemes uh, be available to others to use. And we'll pick up on that thought. There are libraries in SORT both for uh, ratings criteria and for comments criteria. So uh, there is that potential of uh, learning from ourselves and from what our fellow instructors have done. So can students provide adequate feedback on substantive law? 
And one of the good things about SWORD is that it's an ongoing project at Pitt and is um, constantly being researched in various classes and studied to see how well it works and um, whether or not it's effective and how it can be tweaked to perhaps make it more effective. So, so here are some of the um, results of research studies on SWORD peer assessment. Um, studies have shown that ratings by multiple peers are at least as valid as instructor ratings. This was a big study that um, of 708 students across 16 different courses from four universities. So we were here. So just use those. Yeah. And click, and that's what this. Yeah. Right. right there. Got it. Okay. How do peer assessments compare to faculty assessments of student work? Um, this was a study where a graph of the correlation between how faculty rated rated um, student work and how the peers review reviewed the student work. And the correlation is 0.6 or 0.7. However, when they also studied how other faculty teaching the same subject rated um, a, a writing of a student, it was at this exact same level. So basically, students do as well as other faculty in rating um, their students. If you use student reviews. if you use multiple students per paper, that's with multiple. That's why uh, you use four or five uh, peer reviewers per paper. Oh, I did it again. Ah. Uh, so uh, I started to uh, work with Chris Shun, and I saw that research, and I thought, well, that's fine for general writing quality, but. Uh, can peers really provide adequate feedback uh, to other law students on substantive issues of law, the kind of thing that I'm teaching in intellectual property courses? And so I distinguished uh, two different kinds of criteria. On the left are sort of more general legal analytical criteria that don't mention any particular claim, but that could be used in almost any uh, argumentative writing context in law. And on the right, uh, an example of a criteria that deals with substantive law that's more problem specific, uh, that might even deal with a particular claim, uh, like the one I showed you before, personal jurisdiction in a scenario that I uh, created. And it occurred to me um, uh, more legal instructors might use computer-supported peer review if they believe that students could provide adequate feedback on substantive law. And uh, when one speaks of the adequacy of feedback, one is speaking of two considerations. Validity, do the rubric assessments measure what they're intended to measure? And reliability, does the rubric produce consistent results when used by different assessors or on different occasions? And so I engaged uh, with a graduate student in an experiment where we compared the two types of criteria in terms of these uh, reliability and validity. And just to give you a sense of how this uh, might look, you don't have to read the details here, but this is an example of one of my tortured uh, midterm exam question uh, scenarios. In this one, uh, an undergraduate is uh, telling his uh, programming course instructor, Professor Smith, about uh, a music application that he thought was interesting. Later, Smith realizes that that's got some potential. He hires Barry, a computer science master's degree candidate, to work on it. Uh, Barry solves some interesting problems in the course of doing that. Then Barry graduates. He starts a company, VG Games, uh, and uh, creates Guitar Gyro, this uh, nifty little app. Meanwhile, Professor Smith markets his music video game application, Guitar Pyro, uh, that has features a spinning uh, 
guitar neck at one point that bursts into flames, just like the one that Jimmy Hydrax used it, <laughs> that kind of thing. Be glad you're not an IP <laughs> or professor. Uh, and so, again, you don't have to read the details here, but when I create a hypothetical like that in, uh, uh, in all that gory detail, I have uh, claims in mind. Uh, I try to be anal about it. I actually try to answer my own problem in advance, uh, uh, creating uh, a key. Uh, and so here we had uh, one, two, three, four, five uh, claims that were sort of targeted uh, in this exam. And we uh, used two types of review criteria, the more domain uh, general kind and the problem specific kind. We had four criteria, issue identification, argument development, justifying overall conclusion, and writing quality, none of which referred to specific claims. And in the problem specific rubric, uh, we had a rating scale uh, of one to seven for each of the five claims. And with respect to uh, validity, uh, we found that uh, in the case of both types of uh, criteria, the problem specific and the more uh, domain general, uh, we did have a correlation between uh, the uh, peer ratings and my summative scores, uh, a correlation of 0.73, uh, which is uh, strong for the problem specific ones, uh, less so, uh, but still moderate for the domain relevant ones. I don't hold this out as uh, a, a definitive demonstration that problem specific is more valid than uh, the, the general ones. I'd need to reproduce this experiment on multiple classes uh, in order to do that, and I just haven't. And then with respect to reliability, which again is consistency of results when used by different assessors, uh, we found the reliability numbers, which vary the way we were measuring it between zero and one, ranged uh, between uh, 0.3 or so and 0.95. Uh, there were some that were on the high end of that, so uh, we uh, felt that there was some uh, reasonable reliability uh, just this past term in my uh, 2014 uh, spring midterm, I used uh, SWORD, and SWORD now provides a much more convenient uh, um, reporting of re reliability. And uh, so I had another problem situation with these six claims and achieved reliability. Uh, of 0.65 or above, and from the point of view of uh, SWORD, that's considered to be uh, an indication that you're doing okay. If you fall below 0.65, then you need to uh, throw in some additional uh, criteria or take other steps. And so we seem to be doing okay with respect to reliability. And to summarize then, uh, peer assessments in our experiment show that uh, law student peer reviewers can apply substantive legal criteria in a valid way, uh, not with high reliability, but with acceptable uh, reliability. Um, uh, and I'm not sure uh, that we really understand reliability in the context of our law school uh, writing essay exams. Uh, we almost never under uh, undertake the experiment of having law professors grade the same exam, right? And that would be a real demonstration of reliability, and I dare say uh, we would not be showing very high results there either. Uh, uh, the best practices were, of course, pointed out that uh, the end of the semester essay exam is neither valid nor reliable nor fair, uh, and this is a kind of ex experiment that just isn't done in law school. Uh, plus, we're um, devising uh, problem scenarios, uh, and I'm packing them with facts to make them as ambiguous as possible, to, to make it, uh, to, to give rise to strong arguments either way on the claims. So these are very ill-defined problems, and uh, you wouldn't expect to see the sort of reliability that you would achieve in a math class or a psych class even, I, I think. Okay. Oh. All right, just
students benefit from peer review? Not can they do it, but um, is it good for them? Or does it work? Um, so you're probably wondering um, if a lot of people use it, this could be a bad thing, but does it actually work? And the short answer is yes, it does, even better than expected. Again, I'm going to look at some studies that have been done on SWORD, and um, they've looked at how performing peer reviews affects the students who are doing the reviewing, and it turns out that the process of providing feedback improves the student's writing. So here is a graph of a study that says that um, shows you that because the process of providing feedback to others is itself a learning experience. In this study, they found that across a variety of dimensions of their writing, flow, logic, and insight, their own writing improved substantially when they were providing comments and feedback. And that's the real opportunity of peer review. That turns out to be a really big learning opportunity for your students. The students are actually working on their own writing at the same time as they're reviewing their peers' writing. But it gets even more interesting because when we look at the quality of the improvement of the revisions, so if students do a first draft, then review and are reviewed, and then do a second draft, um, after students re have re received the feedback on their first draft, they improve more when they've had multiple peers review their paper than when the faculty have reviewed their paper. Yeah, it's true. The, re the revisions are better with when the drafts are reviewed by multiple peers. And this is a graph that shows that when you, well, you get perhaps a few more revisions from having a single, the single expert would be the faculty member. Um, you get a lot of revisions with the faculty member, they tend to be just little fixes. When you look at complex revisions of documents, the most changes and the best quality of revisions come in response to feedback from multiple peers, which kind of makes sense because if a bunch of people tell you that your introduction sucks, you might take it more to heart than if just one person tells you that your introduction sucks. So. Um, this was an evaluation done by a neutral party, a writing instructor who looked at the first draft and the, second, and the revisions. And so now you can ask yourself whether you're actually hurting your students by not letting them use peer review. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, I don't have hard numbers uh, for uh, the legal context uh, because uh, I haven't yet really solved the problem of creating a pretest and a post-test uh, that can actually measure what I'm trying to teach them. But I have, uh, prompted by the way, by uh, the, the fact that I knew I would be speaking here, I, I looked at my online uh, teaching evaluations from uh, the students. Uh, Pitt has gone to having them file them online, and of course not many students do that, uh, about 50% uh, of, of the students uh, file the course evaluations now as compared to the older days when it was. And, uh, but I did gather uh, 51 from three different uh, classes that I had, uh, where students not only filled them out but had also written comments. And I was interested to see that only six of the comments dealt with the peer review uh, midterm uh, activity. Uh, which in itself, I think, says something. It isn't that bad. Uh, and two were positive. Uh, one said, I really enjoyed doing the peer evaluations. It provided good insight as to what I was missing. Uh, another, uh, continue on and perhaps deepen the peer review assignments as they are very helpful in forcing students to firmly grasp and analyze applicable concepts. Three of them were negative in ways that you might well anticipate. Uh, not an efficient use of anyone's time. I don't really care what my pair peers think of my exam paper. I have to show them these results, I guess. Um, uh, I don't think anybody put that much effort into reviewing papers. Um, people are interested in the professor's grade, not in anonymous students. Uh, I also can't honestly say I can do a good job of critiquing an essay before I realize how poorly or how 
uh, well I've done uh, based on the instructor's grading of it. Uh, you know, all attitudes that we recognize and that are reasonable, although uh, think about the, the nature of the student's self-image who's writing this, uh, or their understanding of the educational process, uh, probably pretty naive. One comment I was very taken with, provide a model answer by which to grade other students for the peer review exercise. Now, of course, uh, faculty do publish model answers after exams, which I think is a good thing. But here, one could throw in the model answer uh, sort of in an anonymous way to each, um, so that each uh, group, well, I'm not quite sure how to work it out, but so that some of the students uh, certainly are, are actually grading the professor's uh, answer to the problem. Uh, that's something I want to uh, try in the future. But for my uh, spring IP, uh, I thought I would get clever, and I added an additional comment prompt. Uh, so reviewers saw this prompt as well as the other prompts. In reviewing the author's paper, did you learn something about the midterm exam question, about the relevant IP law and how it applies to the facts in the question, about how to organize the exam answer about legal writing more generally. Tell the author what you learned. And I collected those and started to look at them again in preparation for, for this uh, event. And well, you could imagine some of them <laughs> didn't learn anything. Some learned that they left out some stuff in their midterm exam without being too specific. Others learned some nice things about writing exams, like the importance of uh, labeling issues. Some learned about law school exam writing. Um, generally, uh, it's important to use all the facts given uh, to cite relevant legal standards. Who knew? <laughs> uh, to elaborate upon each issue. There were a lot of uh, comments about better ways to organize answers based on what they had seen in the papers that they reviewed. Uh, some learned how to use cases more effectively. I was particularly taken with the first one. I found it interesting how you cited facts from the various cases we read <laughs> instead of just quoting the rule of law. It helped draw conclusions between the exam fact pattern and other situations. This student has discovered reasoning by analogy you know, <laughs> from reviewing the midterm exam. And then what really blew me away were 30 comments where students specifically referred to things that they had learned from the peer review exercise that were the things I was trying to teach. So I've italicized them. Things about right of publicity, assigning rights to invention, section 1052, different potential property theories, uh, stuff about uh, section 1125A, and in particular, this one, the thing I drew from your paper, most was your analysis of the descriptiveness issue in trademark registration. It was extremely thorough on that specific issue, much more than in my paper, and used all the proper precedents. It showed me that I needed to have a much deeper analysis. Also, by doing the review, I noticed that I forgot to mention the use and commerce factor when analyzing the trademark registrability issue, and I did not notice whether the slogan would be deemed deceptive and bar registration. Now, these things don't matter to you, mean much to you, because you don't teach trademark law, but these are important things that are in the course materials that I want students to, to learn. Uh, I have been teaching since 1989. I have never had an experience of seeing anything, any frank recognition from students that they learned something useful, you know, <laughs> until I looked at these. <laughs> it brought tears to my eyes. <laughs> I guess this is... There you go. No, that's you. Yeah. So, uh, a little bit now about how we... Uh, imagine the future of uh, computer-supported peer review. Uh, so I was, uh, I have a joint appointment, I'm at the Learning Research and Development Center, and Chris Shun is a colleague there, and uh, we decided, along with a colleague, Diane Littman, to apply for an NSF grant to do some uh, research on what we came to call the Argument Peer Project, uh, 
whose goal is to have students uh, plan written arguments by first diagramming their arguments in advance. And so we were thinking of ways of uh, combining computer-supported peer review with argument diagramming. And I had a program, Lassad, that uh, could help students create argument diagrams. And uh, I come from a computer science and AI background, and so we were interested in how uh, AI, artificial intelligence, could help at the margins by helping the authors prepare the argument diagrams and texts, by helping the reviewers prepare better reviews, and I just want to give you a little sense of that. So here's a, a picture of the overall uh, activity. Uh, and so far, the stuff that Suzanne and I have been talking about is author writes paper, uh, submits to the system, peers review the papers, and the author revises the paper. But in the argument part, peer project, we imagine an initial phase where uh, students re uh, read the assigned source texts, what a small number of cases maybe, they create an argument diagram of the, uh, a diagram of the argument they want to make, peers review the diagrams of the arguments, again using SWORD, the author uh, revises the argument diagram, the program generates an outline of the text from the argument diagram, and then the peer review process that we described takes place, where we have AI um, guiding the preparation of the diagram and its use in writing, and we have AI uh, guiding the reviewing in a particular way. And uh, just to give you a flavor for that, here is a student's uh, argument diagram created for a legal writing exercise. Uh, the uh, task involved um, a, a case from a few years ago involving a man whose name was Alvarez, who misrepresented, lied about the fact that he had received the Congressional Medal of Honor. And it turns out that there is a federal statute that makes that a crime. And cases came up as to whether that statute was constitutional or not. And it was to go up before the Supreme Court. And so uh, Ann Sinsheimer, the legal writing instructor, uh, put the materials together. Uh, interestingly, there were very balanced arguments at the circuit court level. Uh, and students' task was to uh, read the circuit court decision uh, and to uh, create a brief to the Supreme Court for one side or for the other. And we had them diagramming the arguments that they made for either side. And the diagram uh, has a variety of different kinds of boxes. We call them nodes to represent uh, conclusions, claims, uh, and citations. And the arcs represent support or opposition. And in the text boxes of the arts, they explain the reasons why this, this citation supports this claim or uh, opposes it. And so it's a way of uh, thinking in advance of how you're going to marshal your uh, sources and what are you marshaling them for, what claims are you going to. It's very, very basic argument uh, diagramming. But uh, parenthetically, the program has a little expert system that can analyze the diagrams as they're being produced and provide help to a student in uh, preparing the diagram. And then when the diagram is finished and after the diagramming peer review has completed, you don't have to read the details, but the program basically uh, walks through the argument diagram and constructs a kind of outline of the text of an argument. Now, a student would have to do still a fair amount of work in turning, to turn that into a written argument, but none of the text that they took the time to put into the boxes in the diagram, none of it is lost. It's here and uh, placed in as appropriate way as we can, given artificial intelligence, we're trying to get better at that. And then, this is just a suggestion of what's happening, but you remember I described computer-supported peer review, and at one point, reviewers submit their feedback via the system. At this point, when the reviewer submits the reviews to the system, 
Diane Littman's got a natural language uh, machine learning program that analyzes it and makes suggestions that the reviewer be more specific as to the location in the text where this problem has been identified and more specific about the solution. Uh, natural language can, is that is good is at least good enough to do that, and uh, the and the reviewers then get the reviews back, if you will, uh, and are asked to see well is the system right? Can you improve that? And then they resubmit it and it goes to the authors. And the last little bit is that we're developing a a system that guides the. Uh, uh, revision process. Uh, so the authors are receiving these reviews from multiple reviewers and we're uh, providing a revision planning tool and this is hard to uh, see but in this tool all of the review comments from all of the reviewers, the four or five reviewers, are organized by the criteria and the student is asked to uh, made a, a, uh, a determination with respect to each one whether they should do something about it or ignore it and if they are going to ignore it why they are going to ignore it. We haven't used this in a law school context. I'm not sure I'm ready to use it in a law school context but we are using it in a high school context and the students seem to uh, like the structure uh, that it provides. Um, okay, so just to give you a sense of SWORD, it's been around for about 10 years and it has turned out to be broadly perceived as useful um, by educators. It's been used all over the world by about 27,000 students. And even though it was originally conceived of for a psychology, a field where um, field that's very popular with very large classes, it's turned out that a lot of other disciplines have found it to be useful in classes of all sizes. It's used in physics labs, it's used in English lit. Um, across the board, there's more and more clever use of SWORD. And uh, to find out more about it, this is the um, URL to look at SWORD. All of these studies that I referenced are also linked to the SWORD website, so you can read exactly uh, what studies have been done and what the results have been. Um, so the way it works, again, is that faculty create writing assignments and rubrics that students use for reviewing. The documents flow into the tool, um, the digital tool they get assigned to reviewers. SWORD handles everything from the deadlines to the ratings, the algorithm, the comment helpfulness ratings. And um, the pricing is also on the website. It's not free, but it's not super expensive either. So I don't know, I'm sure that they must uh, basically try to even things out, make enough money to pay for whatever it is that they need to pay for. I don't think anybody's make, getting rich off of this. In a university context, it's called tech transfer, and um, considerations come into play, but the academics have very little to say about it. <laughs> yes, pit, pit teachers have to pay this thing. I did want to uh, revisit that uh, suggestion I made before that as more legal instructors use computer supported peer review systems, resources become available uh, such as libraries of legal instructional materials, those rating criteria and comment prompts that are so uh, convenient for another professor to edit uh, for their own assignment. Uh, one could also imagine the writing assignments themselves becoming available. Uh, uh, brief writing exercises, legal exam, essay questions, uh, including the instructor's comments. I mean, we're all as faculty engaged in authorship and design of these uh, elaborate exams, these problem scenarios, these exercises, uh, collection of briefs like the Alvarez situation. Something could be, these could be used again. Uh, there's a problem if you use it again in your same classroom, but someone else could make use of it, and the sword creates a kind of community of users that could uh, help in that respect. 
Also, uh, I wanted to just point out that now, as students are submitting things online, as these diagrams are being prepared uh, with computer uh, corpora, corpuses of uh, de-identified student writings could be available for machine learning and natural language programs to learn to extract arguments from them, for example, or uh, uh, for improving other ways uh, for Diane Littman's program to uh, suggest to reviewers that they approve. So there's a lot of uh, exciting possibilities there, and, and parenthetically for those of you who are librarians uh, and prone, interested in organizing things, I can tell you there's a real need for uh, curatorship in, in that context. And with that, I think we're, we're finished. We've uh, provided an introduction to computer-supported peer review, and in particular with SWORD, uh, focused on the importance of the legal instructor provided review criteria, answered our questions affirmatively, yes, Law students can provide adequate feedback on substantive law. They do benefit from peer reviewing. Uh, we've shown you a little bit about the future of uh, computer-supported peer review and argument diagramming. Parenthetically, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk about online legal instruction and MOOCs uh, nowadays, and what's the problem with the MOOC? There's uh, no feedback, uh, there's little participation. Well, this sort of peer review activity is an ideal uh, sort of acti uh, fe fear uh, feedback activity for a MOOC. And uh, we are creating, or faculty who use the uh, SWORD will be creating communal instructional resources for law school peer review. And with that, we'll take your questions. John? There's two questions. One is, uh, so the assumption here is like four to five reviewers for each paper? Yeah. Well, that's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work, and uh, it's the reason why student peer reviewers are as good as faculty peer reviewers. That's so much of a standard. Yeah. yeah. So, so can you dial that down to three or two, or uh, still get the most of the benefits Chris as has, uh, John, uh, you know, cutting the safety margin? Yeah, or? I'm not the uh, <laughs> statistics jock, but Chris is by, you know, he's fantastic at that, and he'll tell you no fewer than four. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the second question is, why, what, about, what about bringing in non-peer reviewers, like um, practicing attorneys or... Um, Things like that. Well, that's that's very interesting. I uh, teach a course on my own uh, specialty of artificial, applying artificial intelligence to law and modeling legal reasoning. And one time I used uh, SWORD and peer review in that class. And uh, without telling the students, I enlisted the authors of some of the papers to participate in the peer review. <laughs> and then they would. Um, um, provide some feedback on the reviews and even participate in the class, you know, uh, via uh, link up. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And I, I, I think there's real potential with that. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I thought that, I, I mean, I've always thought MOOCs were like pretty pathetic. But this, the idea that you can um, maintain standards for this kind of peer review seems to me like a major step forward in thinking about MOOCs. So, so if we're rethinking things, I'm curious to know why the actual assignment hasn't been re-engineered to make it more compatible. Because the other way to make giving four peer reviews per paper easier is to change what it means to write a paper. Huh? Uh, well, it sounds promising. So how long, how long are the papers that your students were peer reviewing? Uh, Make them shorter. Make them, yeah. yeah. Clearly, uh, in the course of uh, these uh, studies, one finds that the length of the papers uh, are uh, intentionally uh, shortened. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing. It's harder to write a short paper than it is a long one uh, very often uh, when you're making an argument. So uh, no, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I, but, but I did, I, I asked you how long the papers were. Uh, the, uh, I'm trying to remember in Ensenheimer's class, um, the papers I think were uh, 15? Oh, no. not not in these a maximum of uh, five pages. Oh. In my uh, IP class, uh, which it, it's a take-home uh, midterm, 
I keep them down to four pages or three pages. I'm mm -hmm. even pushing toward two pages. Mm -hmm. Right. So you, in fact, you've already thought of that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I, uh, I, I, not in a general way, in a sort of specific problem solving way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, comment and a question. Uh, UF Law is finishing up our last week of a MOOC right now, and we do use peer review for our three research assignments. Excellent. 